We arranged this meeting today because Cynthia and I and Cheryl, and I'm sure lots of people out there are getting lots and lots of questions. So we had um, the generosity of both of our doctors, Dr. Fernandez and Dr. Um, Papamathiakas, to give us a little update and some slides regarding pulmonary arterial hypertension and COVID. And then we're going to have an answer, a question and answer session right after. The doctors may have to log off, but Cynthia and I can sure I'll probably be able to stay on if you have questions. Also here I have um, Elizabeth if you have questions about appointments and Angela is also here if you have questions about the CTEP program. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Tim Fernandez and he's going to start presenting. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Julie, everyone who helped uh, put this together. Um, like Sandy said, this is a very hot topic. You know, I have talked at the, the pulmonary hypertension support group in the past, and uh, I'd much rather be talking about clinical trials or, you know, new drugs or something else. But this is the era we live in where we have to deal with COVID-19. I personally have a lot of questions about COVID-19, and it's been something that we've been talking a lot about here. And I'm sure those of you who have pulmonary hypertension, who have loved ones with pulmonary hypertension, have lots and lots of questions. And so um, I want to save a lot of time to, to get those questions uh, answered because it can be a very scary time. But um, I hope with good information and um, some reassurance that, uh, you know, we can get back to life as we know it fairly quickly. We just need to bear with us for the next couple of uh, weeks and months. So uh, we'll go over COVID and how it emerged and, um, you know, what to do and some, some guidance with pulmonary hypertension and COVID and then, you know, what we're doing here to sort of address the issues. So, you know, you may have heard about coronavirus and SARS-CoV and COVID-19 and, and um, it, it can get a little bit confusing. Coronaviruses actually are a, a class of viruses that have been around for a long time. Corona comes from the Latin for crown, and, and this is a, a sort of a cartoon of what it looks like. It has these little spikes on it that make it look a little bit like a crown. And coronaviruses are fairly common. They cause the common cold, and there's four that are commonly circulating. And so um, we have some experience with coronaviruses, and they usually come from animals, typically bats. There's about um, 70 known coronaviruses in bats. And it's when these new coronaviruses jump over from an animal um, host to humans, that's where we have problems. We as a humanity don't have any immunity against the new ones that come up. It's just a matter of how sick the virus makes you, um, determines how sick and how much effect it has on the world's population. So with this specific coronavirus, really the story began in December, where um, in Wuhan, a city that I had never heard of until all of this started, but a city that is larger, about one and a half times larger than New York City, that is where uh, the first uh, cases of these viral pneumonias were noted in December. And the doctor there, one of the pulmonologists there, noticed that there were a couple of cases of this severe pneumonia with all of the other um, known um, viruses and bacteria uh, were not being detected. And so it took some time to get it reported up. Eventually, um, it was found to be widespread in Wuhan in all of January. And by the end of January, the WHO was declaring this public health emergency and ultimately, it was, it was probably too late by that time because there were cases popping up around the world. Um, I think the first case in the United States was somebody that returned from Wuhan to the Seattle area at the end of January. Throughout all of February, everyone was trying to sort of ramp up the testing and find cases, but it was a slow process. That sort of delay in, in the diagnostics allowed the virus to start circulating more widely in the community. And ultimately, by the time we, we uh, got to March, the WHO declared this a pandemic. Almost every country in the world has uh, now described cases. It is really accelerating in the United States. And, and um, as everyone knows, it's affected every facet of your daily life because we have to deal with how we're going to respond and try and um, um, limit the spread. So what are 
the symptoms of this viral pneumonia. Um, uh, so the disease itself is called COVID-19, and, and the main symptoms are fever, a cough, and worsening shortness of breath. And um, this is a, a case. So last week I was in the ICU. Um, uh, one of my partners, Dr. Kim Kerr, I, I don't know if she's in the other room still or not. She's taking care of um, the COVID patients in the ICU. Um, but this is one of our first cases here in San Diego of a guy who has this COVID-19. And the normal areas of lung are, are the lungs should normally be black, um, in, like in the upper lobes here. All of these white and gray areas are this bad viral pneumonia that this um, gentleman is, is suffering from. And um, as that involves the lungs and causes this bad pneumonia, patients require escalating amounts of oxygen, ultimately end up needing to be put on a ventilator. Right now, there are no proven effective treatments for this viral pneumonia. We have a number of clinical trials that we're, we're working on and enrolling patients um, to try and find treatments for, for this uh, pneumonia. But um, right now, this is pretty devastating and it takes time for these patients to recover. It involves uh, intensive use of resources in the, um, in the ICU. What is this coronavirus? So COVID-19 is the disease caused by this new coronavirus that emerged from Wuhan and it is very efficient in being spread person to person, even now without travel history to these affected regions, it's spreading widely in the community. How is it transmitted? It's similar to other viruses. It's really thought to be through droplets um, produced when somebody coughs or sneezes. And then um, these droplets um, either go directly onto a mucous membrane like your eyes or your mouth, or if um, a person were to touch a surface and then touch their eyes or mouth, they can introduce the virus from the surface. So this makes it a very um, effective and highly contagious um, virus because it is so easily spread. It can be spread even among people in, in um, the healthcare or uh, people in, in close contact in a house. This is sort of the timeline of what happened. Um, the disease in January was really discovered in Wuhan and then spread all throughout China. And then by late January, it was really popping up all over the world. The first real hotspots outside of China were in Italy there, which by the end of February, you'll see it becomes very dark. And then um, Iran there uh, that has 63, 95 cases. You really saw the, the exponential rise of cases throughout February in those, those countries. By the end of February, there was only 62 cases in the United States. And so I think some people were, were optimistic that maybe it wouldn't be so bad here as it was in Italy and, and Iran. But in March, um, this only goes through the first two weeks of March, we really saw the start of the exponential rise of cases with these really hot zones, specifically in the Seattle area, uh, New York City, and then um, in the Bay Area. But now um, all 50 states um, have cases reported and there are these second and third waves of cases happening in places like New Orleans, Detroit, Chicago, um, and potentially Los Angeles. Um, um, and so, you know, it, it's not just a New York problem, not just a Seattle problem, it's an everywhere problem. Part of the problem is that um, there's a range of symptoms. You probably have seen um, some of these uh, celebrities who have posted that they have COVID-19, people like Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson and some NBA players and that. The majority of people who get this disease are have very mild cases and are relatively asymptomatic. Um, about 80% are mild to asymptomatic. The top 20% are the ones who have more symptoms and require more resources. About 14% of patients with COVID uh, end up getting admitted and something like 6% end up needing the ICU. And those patients are the ones that are at highest risk for, for dying from this. So um, when you have a uh, virus like this, where you have a lot of minimally symptomatic or asymptomatic carrier, it makes it very difficult to control. So that's why you've probably seen graphs and heard this phrase, flattening the curve. In order to 
prevent the healthcare system from exceeding its capacity, we really need everyone's buy-in to stay at home. You also could be interacting with people who look healthy, but may also have the disease and and may get you sick and you may get sicker from it. So um, the only way we can really deal with a virus like this, where we have no treatment, we have limited capacity to test right now, we don't have any way of knowing whether somebody has had the virus in the past and has developed immunity um, and there's no vaccine, the only effective way to prevent us from exceeding our capacity for the healthcare system is to, uh, you know, shelter in place, close all the schools, close all the large gatherings and try and limit exposures to the virus. That's where we're at right now with this. This is the California projection. And right now, you know, this is April 2nd, this is just the dawn of this problem. Really, the peak is not expected until the end of April. So we have hunger down. Um, We have uh, a few weeks and months of of sheltering in place um, until things get better. And the current projection, this green line here is, is our ICU capacity. And there's a dashed green line down here. And and what that shows is that we're coming right up to the capacity of the ICUs in California. There are other places, if I would have have put the New York uh, projections there, they're already exceeding their capacity. So um, hopefully, at least in California, and I know there there are probably people from outside California um, zooming in too, but at least in California, our current projections are that we shouldn't exceed our capacity. But, you know, we still need to, to hunker down and, and uh, try and limit exposure and limit the spread. So I mentioned these are the symptoms, a uh, fever, a new cough, and worsening shortness of breath. So those are the things that you need to be cognizant of if you or somebody around you um, has um, these symptoms that, you know, this is a virus that is widely circulating right now. Just because you have those symptoms, though, doesn't mean you need to come into the ER. So when to seek medical attention? So most people who have this disease um, have mild symptoms and don't require any medical attention. If everyone that had any cough or shortness of breath were to come to the emergency department, it would overwhelm the system. The most important first step, if you have these symptoms, is to call your doctor and, and discuss them and discuss how you're doing and whether or not you're sick enough to merit coming into the hospital. Now, somebody with pulmonary arterial hypertension or CTEF, they're going to merit coming into the hospital. But call us and let, give us forewarning if um, you're not feeling well. If you have new symptoms, please call. So the emergency warning signs, if you're having really difficult time breathing, if you have pain or pressure in the chest, if your lips are blue, I know that's sort of the, the, the PH Aware logo, the blue lips, uh, but if those things are, are new or worse, um, please go immediately to the emergency department. One of the questions that we've gotten is, what can you take if you have some of these symptoms, um, especially um, specifically with pulmonary arterial hypertension? So this is a good list to keep because even if you have the common cold, these are are still the same recommendations. Some of the -the over-the-counter cold medicines that contain um, phenylephrine or Sudafed are potent vasoconstrictors and can actually make pulmonary hypertension worse. So in no setting should any pulmonary hypertension patient be using um, Sudafed or like neosinephrine. Um, those can make things worse. The Afrin nasal spray is okay, or just a saline nasal rinse or with like a neti pot um, is also fine. Specifically for COVID, um, there's a recommendation to avoid ibuprofen for fevers um, that may be due to COVID. Um, in France, they have some signs that people who were treated with ibuprofen did worse. So if you're having fevers or muscle aches, Tylenol is the drug of choice for this condition. I like to recommend saline sinus rinses and mucinex, I think, are good for congestion um, and then after nasal spray if necessary. Um, it's also important to note that some of the cough suppressants, you have to read the label because some of the Robitussins do have some Sudafed in them. So you have to be careful with what you're putting into your body. What can I do to prevent getting COVID? So This is from the World Health Organization. They say, do the five. These are the things you can do to stop the spread. We need to be vigilant about washing our hands, 
We need to be vigilant about covering our mouth with your elbow and coughing into your elbow. We need to try and not touch our face. And we need to keep social distance um, away from other people. And if you're sick or people around you are sick, they need to stay home. Um, They can't expose other people unnecessarily. So knowing how it spreads is important to preventing the disease from overwhelming the system and keeping you safe. The best way to prevent getting sick is to not be exposed to the virus. As I mentioned, 80% of people with the virus don't have symptoms or have mild symptoms. And so you don't know who you're interacting with, whether or not they're one of those people. So you need to stay home. It's a tough thing to do from a mental health standpoint. It can be a tremendous burden, but for your health, I really strongly encourage you to stay home and not expose yourself unnecessarily to people who may be asymptomatic carriers. If you have to go out, avoid close contact with anyone else and avoid being in the spray zone from people that may cough or sneeze. Even at home, you need to be vigilant about washing your hands. Soap and water work really well for um, ridding yourself of this virus on your skin. If you blow your nose or cough or sneeze, definitely go wash your hands. If you are out and not by a sink with soap, then hand sanitizer is okay. At least 60% alcohol is necessary to kill or inactivate the virus. And then be very vigilant about not touching your eyes, nose, mouth unless you've washed your hands. You need to avoid close contact with people who are sick or people who may be asymptomatic carriers. If you have to interact with others, keep your distance. The newer recommendations from the CDC include um, considering wearing a mask if you have to leave the house to get groceries or or other medicines or anything. um, You know, consider wearing a mask just to cover your mouth and um, try and limit the spread of the virus to you. Any surfaces that you're in close contact with, you need to clean and disinfect frequently. This includes things like tables, doorknobs, light switches. Uh, If you live in an apartment building and have to take the elevator, all those sort of things can be fomites, uh, places where the virus can live and be spread. And if the surface is dirty, you have to clean it first, then use a disinfectant soap um, detergent in order to uh, prevent the spread. One of the questions that we got was, how long can the coronavirus live on various surfaces? In the air, it's about three hours. Um, On copper, four hours. On cardboard, 24 hours. On stainless steel, two to three days. And on plastic, three days. All this means is that whenever you're touching any of these things, do not touch your face after touching these surfaces. Wash your hands after you touch anything. So... You need to get food, you need to get Amazon deliveries, and uh, um, you need to still live your life. But after you've touched those things that you don't know where they've been, you need to wash your hands um, before you move on. So what about pulmonary hypertension and COVID? There is a lot of concern about, you can't even get toilet paper at, at the grocery store. What is going to happen to my pulmonary hypertension medicines? Both the specialty pharmacies, the Credo and CVS Caremark, have reached out to us. Um, ensuring that the supply chains for pulmonary hypertension medicines are not disrupted. They are doing everything in their capacity to ensure that everyone still has all of their pulmonary hypertension medicines. There were some recommendations from the CDC and others that you should get at least a month's supply of your medicines and call your doctor and, and ask for a month's supply. That's not feasible with these specialty pharmacy medicines. But if you're running out and you're concerned, um, you know, you can reach out to the specialty pharmacy directly or to us. We've been told by the specialty pharmacies and by the, the pharmaceutical companies that they're doing everything in their power to make sure that the supply chains are not disrupted for pH drugs. If you're in a pulmonary hypertension study, especially from our center, you know, we don't have very many active studies. Some of the other studies have been put on pause. So we're not actively recruiting new patients for any of the studies during this pandemic. If you're interested, once the pandemic clears about studies, then you can also reach out to us. We want to do everything we can to keep you healthy and at home. So if you develop fevers, call and let us discuss your medicines. Let us decide whether or not you need to continue your Lasix and Bumex and those medicines if you're febrile. If you're doing well at home, stay on all of your medicines. Nothing's going to change.
Be very careful with what you eat. Everyone's in their their emergency stockpiles of canned soups and things that have lots of salt in them. That salt is needed for a preservative and to make food taste good. But if you are eating nothing but canned soup, you will quickly become volume overloaded. So always good practice to limit salt intake with pulmonary hypertension. You know, I see some of my patients there in clinic, I always talk about salt and salt is hidden in food. It's not just the salt you put on your food with the salt shaker or what you add during the preparation. There's salt in all foods and specifically any foods that come from a restaurant, they add a lot of salt to make them taste good. And then processed foods. So anything out of a can, anything out of a bag, anything frozen, they they add a lot of salt to preserve those things. And that quickly adds up causes you to retain fluid, and that that is a recipe for disaster with pulmonary hypertension. This is a scary time. I I won't uh, mince words, but we have to take care of ourselves and take care of the whole body, including your, your mental health. One of the questions that we got was, where do you go to get good quality information? I think everyone, myself included, I know Dr. Papamathiakis, we're on social media and looking at what people are saying about coronavirus and COVID and what's happening. And we need to unplug and uh, take it down a notch and give our brains a break. We're trying to limit uh, our, our consumption of COVID news, I think is always a good idea. Take time to unwind. Use reputable sources to get your information. Don't believe everything you see on Facebook. Um, go by what the CDC is saying. You know, consider there's two apps, Headspace and Calm. Both of those apps are are meditation apps that have provided free resources to help with mindfulness in this time. Because I know personally, I am a a warrior and have have had sleeping problems. And um, I'm sure everyone's in a similar space. And uh, you can clear your mind. um, it, It makes everything seem better. But the final thing is that we're still open. We are a hospital here. We are the pulmonary hypertension center for, you know, this part of Southern California. If you need to come into the hospital with pulmonary hypertension, we would be the center that would be preferred. Now, um, if you're sick and need emergency care, you should go locally and then ask to be transferred in. But we want to still be your doctors and still take care of you. Someone did mention whether they can have access to the slides. So as long as Tim's okay with it, we can create a PDF and then we can email that out to to everyone as long as there's no uh, issues. One thing to remember is some of these get outdated relatively quickly with a turnaround in information. So in a couple of days, some of these things may be a little bit off. But I do want to reemphasize what Tim said at the end, that there was a a couple of questions there, you know, should I bother my doctor about this? Yes. The answer is yes. You call your primary care, you call us, um, you email us, you might chart us, it doesn't matter. Um, The important thing is that open line of communications, we're still working, we still want to make sure that everyone's okay. It is a little bit harder with our pH patients because you have shortness of breath, you've had cough, and this is definitely something new. It has to be a new cough, a new shortness of breath, a new fever. It doesn't matter. If you're worried, you still call us. We can definitely do one of these uh, MyChart visits so we can actually look at you uh, and even do a rudimentary exam through the, the video conferencing. And it's better to, to be safe than sorry, right? So call us. We'll, we'll talk about it. We'll go over it uh, and then move on. There was one quick question on the chat. I just wanted to recap for whoever whoever is not following the chat. Um, there's a question specifically about whether we know prognosis and outcomes in pH patients um, and COVID. Uh, we only have anecdotes of the patients having COVID. The one I know did well, but generally speaking, when you have a pre-existing condition, that puts you at higher risk for having complications with COVID-19 so that regardless of how well uh, controlled your pulmonary hypertension is, it's still scary to get it. Having said that, unless you're on immunosuppressive medication, so if you have uh, some sort of connective tissue disease, rheumatoid arthritis, or some other related disease with pulmonary hypertension, you're not necessarily at higher risk of getting it, but if you do get it, you are at higher risk of having problems with it. First one that I write here is, my husband's considered an essential worker. What extra precautions should I be taking since he's still working? I do constantly go around cleaning with Lysol. So I think is sticking to what Tim said, which is disinfect everything, make sure that the person that's being exposed, in the case the husband or the partner, is extra careful. So some of the things that we do being exposed, we tend to now be wearing scrubs more than ever before. We usually get rid of our scrubs at the end of our shifts. 
in the hospital so we don't bring any soiled yeah. clothes at home. We often leave the shoes outside of the house. Yeah. That's something that we do. And another thing that we started doing is different jackets for work, things of that nature. So um, generally speaking, I think that's the main thing. Now, if you want to be extra careful, you know, there's the argument of could the partner that's an essential worker and a high risk of exposure get sick and actually be asymptomatic and be a carrier and then put you at risk. So the amount of social distancing that you'll do at home and how much can you really do depends on your living situation and depends on a lot of other things. But We've had extreme situations where healthcare workers that have been exposed have chosen not to stay in the same house. They may stay in the guest room. They use different bathrooms. So it ends up being some sort of compromise as to how exactly you can, you can tackle something like this. The second question I have here is now, I know the virus can live on cardboard and I can take precautions with the outer portion of boxes. How concerned should I be with the contents inside of the packages from specialty pharmacies or online retailers? I think that's also a good question. You know, the, the idea is that whoever handled the packaging probably touched the inside as well. So I think your best bet is to disinfect the surfaces of all the packaging all the way down to the actual pill bottle. It doesn't have to be put them through fire or bleach them for an hour. You take a disinfectant wipe, you disinfect it for a few seconds and let it air dry and that should be fine. And wash your hands after touching anything. Again, everyone's a little bit different and their level of, of worry can be at, at different levels. And please, Sandy and Tim, jump in with this. But there are a couple of YouTube videos that show a, a very slow but thought out and, and secure way of bringing in groceries, for example, and going through a process of, you know, this is your clean area. You leave all the uh, stuff in the dirty area, which is next to it. You take one thing at a time out. You disinfect it. You put it in your clean spot. You then get rid of the dirty stuff from the dirty area. You wash your hands. You disinfect the dirty area. You wash your hands again. That's kind of the idea. You just need to be extra vigilant. I want to add something. Um, you know, we've had a lot of people calling about soap and water, gargling with soap and water, um, cleaning vegetables with soap and water. Soap is not a good thing to ingest. And I don't recommend at all to gargle with soap and water and I went on the FDA websites and other few websites, and they're not recommending to wash your fruits that aren't seed. Um, they don't have um, skin on them with soap and water because it's almost impossible to get soap off. So don't you know, be washing fruits and vegetables with your dishwasher soap because it can make your stomach really upset. Right. So um, to the question is, has anyone been in contact with specialty pharmacies? Is it possible to make a two-month supply? I think Dr. Fernandez uh, tackled that question. Uh, unfortunately, the way the situation is now, it's not. But um, Is Cheryl on? Does Cheryl want to comment? I'm here. Actually, I did talk to the specialty pharmacies, and some of the medications, if your insurance allows, they will give you a 90-day supply, but that's up to the insurance. But most of the medications like that we are have with REMS are the standard one month. And I, I want to also make sure we don't stress people more. You know, the fact that this is going on, we have shelter in place, it doesn't mean that the entire world is coming to an end. You know, the whole running to the store for toilet paper just in and of itself created the problem rather than the fact that we're running out of toilet paper. Uh, similar with the medications, we don't think that the supply chain is going to be disrupted for these. Um, the fourth question here, is there anything in place in the office in the event our medications don't arrive and are we completely out? Um, what do we do? So we don't have samples. Um, in one of these extreme situations, especially for IV medications, when you come to the ER, uh, you mask, you, we'll take care of you, we'll, we'll start the medication here so that you don't run out and go from there. I don't know if Sandy or Tim, you have something to say on this. You know, the biggest thing is you need to be vigilant. And if you get down to less than seven, call um, your specialty farms, call Cynthia, call myself. Cheryl, can you? you comment what we can do at UCSD if they run out of any of the REMS medicine? Um, I don't think it would change. If you, if you did run out of medication and you needed it emergently, then that would be something that you probably would have to become admitted. There isn't something that we can dispense, but I'm confident that the specialty pharmacies have everything on board and they've worked out systems so that none of this should be happening. 
But remember that it's up to each patient to call and be on top of things. And if you start worrying about getting low, call your physicians. Most of the pulmonary hypertension centers have nurses that deal with this all the time. The other thing that may be a problem, and this is also something that everybody's going to need to keep on top of more now than normal, is that your prior authorizations are in place because every nurse in the country will tell you it's very frequently we get phone calls on Friday afternoon where your prior offs have run out. It's really, really important for you to be vigilant right now. We can't solve the prior off problem in one minute. We can solve I'm low on medicine when you're down to five or six. Um, there was one question that was put in. Are there any known interactions between the usual pH medications such as sildenafil, triclear, flolan, remodulin, et cetera, and the medications being used to treat COVID-19 in the hospitals? So as you know, which Dr. Fernandez went over, is there are no known treatments for the COVID right now, but there are some treatments that have come out that were anecdotally used from Italy and China. And from those medications, like remdesivir or hydroxychloroquine, there are no known drug interactions that we know of with the typical um, pH meds. But some of the, um, there's one drug interaction with bocentin and sildenafil with the medications that are antiretrovirals, but those are known drug interactions that we already are aware of and we are using. So those can be easily um, managed. So I'm confident that if anyone had to come into the hospital and was had to be put on any medication, that there wouldn't be any issues. Yeah. And to add to that, you know, I would not self-medicate with anything you hear on TV. If you have a question about that, it's more specific callers. But generally speaking, the drugs that Dr. Fernandez talked about, that's mostly what you should use if you do have a cold. Um, there's a couple more questions that we can go over. So I think um, Dr. Fernandez here at the end gave you some very good resources. And as I mentioned, we're going to share the slides so that you can have those links. I mentioned, and Dr. Fernandez also mentioned specifically that you're not bothering us by contacting us, please do. As far as the vacation question here, I kind of went backwards. You know, we had vacation in May, we canceled it. I think Dr. Fernandez canceled his vacation. When we're talking about June, I think that we're close enough that now June is also becoming questionable. July, August is the time where I would think that hopefully by then things have settled out, that people can start traveling again. But this also a kind of a personal, personal decision. Uh, I'm not sure how to answer this question here in regards to a, a roommate that doesn't seem to want to follow the rules. I think if the roommate does not want to follow the rules and cannot leave the house, then you may have to leave the house yourself. But this just sounds like a very difficult situation. In regards to um, the symptoms, I think we mentioned this already. Uh, yes, the symptoms are similar, but fever is going to be new, cough is going to be new, uh, and shortness of breath is going to be worse than, than usual. Now, he also mentioned this about the news. There's definitely information overload. As Dr. Fernandez said, take a break. Sandy already talked about the soup and water. Don't start Plaquenil. This is still not 100% sure that it works. We don't know if it's uh, good for prophylaxis, meaning that it's going to stop you from getting the disease, or is it good if you have mild disease, or good if you have severe disease? And it does have side effects. It can cause problems with irregular heartbeat. So don't just take it. If you're taking it for another disease process, sure, continue taking your medication, but don't all of a sudden start this. I think Dr. Fernandez mentioned about the sign injuries, there, there should be a pretty innocuous. And then the face mask, I think we covered this as well. You don't need a face mask to just walk around the block. You need a face mask if you are going to be in a space that multiple people are there. So we got a bunch of questions. Where can we get N95 masks for going out to the groceries? Um, that is the million dollar question. You actually don't need an N95 mask to go out and get groceries. Um, in the hospital, the only time that, that Demos and I wear N95 masks is when we are intubating a patient, meaning putting them on a ventilator or doing a bronchoscopy. The rest of the time, we just use regular surgical masks. So, you know, the, the CDC uh, had said, earlier that, uh, you know, you could use a bandana, you know, a fabric mask like that is fine for the general public going out to get groceries. You know, you're just trying to prevent the large droplets of the person next to you coughing or sneezing. That's fine. You don't need a N95 mask for that. And I would add to that um, for, for one minute. Again, I think it's important if you will do the extra step and wear masks or wear gloves, it's really important that you do that properly because if you wear gloves, you touch everything and then touch your phone and touch your face, the gloves are not going to miraculously clean themselves. You still did the exact same thing that you would have done without the gloves. 
And if you wear a bandana and it gets soiled, uh, you touch it and then you touch your face, again, it kind of defeats the purpose. So the masks need to be removed without touching the front part of the mask, just touch the sides around the loops around your ears. You know, the bandana, you got to touch the back of it. You got to wash it right after you, you've used it once. You can't reuse it. The general public is not as trained as uh, uh, those in healthcare about donning and doffing the masks. And you really got to be careful about taking the mask off and contaminating yourself. When you take it off, you need to immediately wash your hands or use PRL or something like that to, to you know, decontaminate. Um, there's a question, should you change clothes as uh, soon as you return from grocery shopping? All of us here in this room are essential provider or essential workers, and so we're still going to work. I have a nice collection of ties that I enjoy wearing that I've uh, put in the back of my closet. Now all I wear is scrubs. I go home, I take my scrubs off in the garage, and then I immediately go shower. So I think that's probably best practices. I don't know, Demos, if you're doing similar. I do about the same. The, the twist for that is I basically get rid of my dirty scrubs at work and put a, a fresh pair before I head home. But same, same story. I kind of get rid of whatever I'm, I'm wearing once I get home. And I think the idea of changing your clothes when you go to the grocery store is going to be your level of comfort. I personally go to the grocery store and I don't change my clothes when I get home. But I do, like Dr. Fernandez says, when I get home from work. So, I mean, I think it's your level of comfort, and I wouldn't say it's not a good idea, but I'm not going to suggest that everybody change their clothes every time they walk outside. Can I add to that? I would change my clothes if I was out of the grocery store and someone sneezed on me or if I was leaning up against some something. But if you're just going to the grocery store, you're kind of keeping your social distance from people, you should be fine if you're, there's nothing around you. So I wouldn't worry too much about that, kind of like what Sandy said. You know, another question we had is, should we go visit friends and our family? I think the question, that answer is absolutely not. We're supposed to be at our homes. We're not visiting family, whether you have pH or not. That's part of the shelter in place. You know, per the CDC guidelines and the governor, we're all supposed to be home unless we're going to the grocery store to the bank. So you shouldn't be out visiting your relatives, even if you get lonely, do FaceTime with them. Yeah, I think we don't know who is an asymptomatic carrier. And anytime you interact with somebody, you are exposing yourself to the potential transmission there. So you need to stay at home. If you have a loved one or somebody that can get the groceries for you, it's best that they do that and you stay at home. If you need to go out, you need to go out. But the goal of this whole thing is to limit interactions with others to stop the spread of the virus. Can I ask you, gentlemen, uh, one question? Not necessarily for pH patients, but for any people that go on to an actual ventilator. We hear a lot of ventilator talk. What is, again, every case is different and unique, but if someone goes on a ventilator because of this, is there percentages or numbers saying like, if you go on it, 50% come off it, 20% don't come off it or whatever it is. Do we know any of those kind of numbers at this point? We do, but I think it, it, it may be premature to start talking about that and for a couple of different reasons. So if you look at mortality rates in different countries, they've been vastly different. Having said that, if you do end up in the ICU on the ventilator, generally speaking, that doesn't have a, a great prognosis. I wouldn't want people to worry too much about that again, because we're talking based on things that happen in Italy and things that's happened in China. And we're not necessarily seeing the same numbers uh, proportionally of deaths here. Um, so I, I think that's something that you know, we can address and, and is slightly tailored from person to person. So there's a question here. Um, I heard it can be harder to wean pulmonary hypertension patients from ventilators. Is that true even for stable pulmonary hypertension? You know, um, I think that um, I keep the issue separated. Um, if you need to go on a ventilator because you are dying of pulmonary hypertension and dying of right heart failure, it is very difficult to get that person off the ventilator. If you have something that is treatable, um, like a pneumonia or something, I think that it's, it is a, a reasonable thing to, to be put on a ventilator and be, be treated. Pulmonary hypertension, um, you know, it complicates everything, as all of you are aware, and, and it makes um, everyone with pulmonary hypertension, when you get even a common cold, you, you, you get sicker. So ideally, we, we don't want to treat patients with pulmonary hypertension. We want to avoid them um, getting COVID, but I don't, I don't think it would 
to be a end all be all that we wouldn't um, intubate those patients. I don't know. Do you have comments? Uh, no, I think that's absolutely right. I, I do want to uh, uh, squeeze in a couple other quick questions here because I think that those are important. One has to do with if you do get intubated, what do we do for your oral medications? And you you don't have to worry about that. We're going to f- figure out a device, a plan to get them to you. Um, we can put them through tubes into your stomach. And if we can't do that, uh, we can use parenterals in some way. Um, and another question that I think are very important because there's like day-to-day things. Can you reuse a mask? Um, if it hasn't been soiled, you haven't been around anyone, you just use it to go to the grocery store, you weren't close to anyone, you took it out the right way, you can probably reuse it. One recommendation is putting it in a paper bag and leaving it outside because if you leave it for enough days, whatever is on it will die as well, the viruses. Um, but the key thing is how do you take it off? How do you put it back on if it has been soiled? And if it's clearly soiled that you can see it, then I would I'll get rid of it and get a new one. Um, and another question here is what's the suggestion for if a family member starts developing symptoms, which I think is a great question. So number one, all the social distance, distancing uh, stuff should be done. Um, it, they should self-isolate in the home. Um, I don't know if you, you watch CNN, but Chris Cuomo, one of the anchors, as COVID, he's you know, stuck in the basement of his family home, not seeing anyone and basically just you know, living out there. Um, and the other thing that I would recommend, if they do have symptoms, we now have drive through testing in a few areas in San Diego, both uh, uh, UCSD as well as other hospitals. Uh, I would say look up where that uh, closest place is, go get uh, a drive through test um, so that you know, so that if, if you don't have it, then you can stop self-isolating. But if you do have it, or if you don't have a result, it would continue isolating until um, you know. UCSD is open. As Dr. Fernandez said, we're still seeing patients. We are doing um, video patient calls. Also, I think that the big thing is please be patient with us. I know that a lot of people want to come, you know, standard. I want to come to the emergency room. I'm not feeling well. We're going to discourage this unless we screen your calls. It's a real good time to be patient, be calm, and believe me, we're going to be here for you. Um, Cynthia and myself, the doctors here, the whole team, and as far as I know, the research people are going, so just be patient with us. We will answer your phone calls, and we're available 24-7 like always.